Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here, uh, especially for a talk that's going to be only aspirationally connected to gravity. The aspiration is that uh, uh, the tool we're going to use, dispersion relation, I fundamentally believe that it's uh, it's it's, uh, it's its point in life is, is, is a hundred year old tool, but it's never really been applied so much in gravity, and I really think it's going to review great things. And so I'm going to start the talk by reviewing some facts uh, along these lines about gravity, and and then I will switch gear and discuss what we actually did, which is we asked, uh, do some of these facts hold for stupid scalar theories? Disappointingly, the answer would be yes. So, so that's the main message. So we'll ask specifically if, uh, so you all know when you have an effective, if you integrate out a heavy particle of mass m, you expect to have a derivative expansion at low energy that's suppressed in powers of, of one over m. That's dimensionalized in the scaling. And it's a rule of thumb. We love it. We trust it. The question is, is it really a theorem? So suppose you integrate out some, suppose the physics you integrate out is some complicated, strongly coupled stuff. Can you put bounds on the size of, of this derivative expansion? So that, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Uh, I should mention that, so this was work uh, published about a month ago. Uh, there was a, some work in progress, and this was related papers at the same time, and other people are thinking about this. So I will not be great about referencing during this talk because it's so short, but uh, that's the context. So. So let's describe the context and the, the technique we're going to use. So, so Kramer's crony told us that when well, they were thinking about light, uh, dispersion of light in the medium. So n is the refractive index, you know, from undergrad physics that's related to the ratio of a uh, phase. Uh, the inverse of it gives you the phase velocity, basically, of light. And what they show is that you can express it as an integral over its imaginary part, which presents absorption. This sort of relation between absorption and, and, and dispersion is nowadays the basics of the uh, unitarity method, which we love. And so the fact that this relation exists is, I mean, I've, I've explored it and many people in this room have explored it in the past. Today, we're not going to even try to compute this imaginary part of n, no cut cuts, key cuts, nothing. All we're going to use is the sign in this formula the fact that this absorptive part is positive. And, and what it implies, so if you just if you just plug in this, this thing, so imagine you have an absorptive part, which is some bump, some kind of frequency, and plug it in this formula. And what you need to learn is that the phase velocity uh, in the infrared is slowed. And the only way you can, have, it's possible to have a phase velocity faster than light, but only if you're just above a resonance. So that's the message from Kramer's crony. Uh, so the slogan is UV can only slow you down. Yeah. Integrals to UV things can only slow down the infrared. Uh, the simple way to remember the sign besides the slogan is uh, if you think about uh, level repulsion. So, so if you think about uh, this heavy mode as like an atom and light as some infrared uh, mode, if you think of each of us as, as, as an oscillator, when you couple two oscillators, the frequencies tend to repel. And, and that's, why, uh, that's why the phase velocity goes down in the IR. Uh, so we're going to apply this to scattering amplitudes. Uh, the analog statement dispersion relation use the uh, minus time variable S plane, which connects analytically the amplitude and its complex conjugate on the on the other cut. Uh, we're not going to go through the origin; it's dangerous. Don't go there. Uh, the important, just reviewing the ingredients, I cannot explain how they go, but causality basically buys you analyticity in the upper half plane. This is not enough. The other thing we need is unitarity, which gives you some boundedness property. And, and to combine those two things, you learn that uh, the amplitude is analytic and bounded at large complex S. And the precise statement is that M over S square vanishes as you take large T. Uh, could try to argue why that's the correct statement, but in a 20 minute talks, that's not impossible. So <laughs> that's not possible. Uh, the claim is that there's a right power, and, and S square is enough to make the amplitude vanish. And that's the idea. Uh, yeah, it's proven axiomatic field theory. Of course, in general context, like in abstract context, like quantum gravity, we can't really prove it because we don't know what the axioms are. But I think one can make physical arguments that justify that. So the implications of this is uh, if M, M over S square vanishes, 
then, then you can write some rules like uh, integral at infinity of ds over s cube mst equals zero. And these some rules are going to relate infrared physics and some ultraviolet cut. And one of the things they give that, that they're known to give is they give you some constraints on effective field theory coefficients. So if you, had, if you have a scalar field theory and you had a d5, the fourth term, it gives you an amplitude that grows like s square. And this coefficient is picked by this sum rule. So you get the sum rule, and you can show that the uh, sum rule is over the imaginary part of the amplitude, so it's positive. Uh, so that's a famous constraint in effective field theories. Uh, another cool thing that it tells you is that gravity is attractive. And the point is that uh, the gravity, if you just draw like three level graph as on the left, give you a force that grows at low energies like S square. Yeah, I'm talking about low energy, uh, even below string scale, okay? Uh, it's not the uh, icon, I don't even have to iconalize, like really low energies. Uh, it grows like S square. And the fact that it grows like S square means that it's captured by, by a sum rule like this in terms of positive things. And the sum rule converge for T negative. So this thing has to be positive and that, that's usual sign. So, so G Newton has to be positive. Okay. So it's beautiful. Uh, and, and, and well, one thing which is kind of cool about this argument, which was pointed out a couple of years ago by uh, Madesina, Edelstein, Zboidov, and Kamano, is that, uh, well, this, this sort of argument, you can really show that, you can really argue that the gravity has to be attractive at all impact parameters. So if you imagine you have higher derivative correction to Einstein gravity, so can you see that far down on my screen? So, so imagine if you have some, some correction, which is seen in your three-point vertex. And so, so if you have a correction like this, now with the gravitons, gravitons have polarizations. So, so if I just focus on the particle on the left, the scattering amplitude is really a two by two matrix. And the statement that the quotient of S square is positive is a statement that the eigenvalues of this matrix should both be positive. When you work out what the matrix actually is, you find that this usual gravity uh, G Newton on the diagonal, and you find that this higher derivative correction gives you some elicity flip and contributes off the diagonal. So if the eigenvalues ought to be positive, the off diagonal terms cannot be big. And you get, in fact, two sided bounds on the sizes of this higher derivative correction. You don't just get sign constraint, you actually get constraint on the magnitude. And, and you get constraints that uh, it has to be cannot be bigger than the smallest impact parameter at which you trust this uh, Feynman diagram. So, so the, the question to be discussed in this talk is are this sort of behavior, yeah, what is special, many, many things in this argument seem special for gravity. The fact that it grows like a square, the fact that uh, there's two polarizations. So what is generic and, and what's special? So we're going to ask, so does causality imply this dimensionalized scaling as it did for the graviton scattering argument? There's something weird about this gravity argument also is that it gives positivity of uh, imaginary part in the ultraviolet gives you some constraint on signs in infrared. But you can kind of run the argument both ways because once you predict the dependence on impact from the infrared effective theory, you can predict the dependence on impact parameter. Of, so we can run this sum rule at any impact parameter. And that gives you infinitely I mean constraint, which has to give you the same number, G Newton. So, so there's some constraint on the U. There, there appears to be some constraint on the UV. It appears that this game goes both ways. And that's, that to me is very puzzling. So I'm going to try to explain that. And, and the last thing is what we'd like to do is we'd like to improve this kind of parametric bound to get actual numerical bounds. Like you know, the the, the 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 correction to gravity cannot be bigger than that number, otherwise you violate causality. So we want to get sharp numbers. Uh, so we're gonna find that all these three things we can do even without gravity. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and yeah, it's gonna kind of, kind of explain. So so here's, here's our setup. So we're gonna explain our setup and our results. So so we study in a single real scalar field. Uh, at low energies, we assume that the theory is weakly coupled at low energies. So, so we just write down, uh, so the, if there are rele relevant interactions, it could look like that, some tree level and, and, and contact interactions. And then you start writing down the uh, higher derivative of corrections. Uh, they're just, uh, they have to be symmetrical polynomials in ST and U, so it's very easy to enumerate them. Just powers of ST, U, and, and, and the other 
quadratic thing. So, so we can easily enumerate our derivative corrections. And our assumption is that at high energies above some cutoff capital M, they, we can have, the amplitude could be strongly coupled, crazy physics, but we're gonna assume that it's causal and unitary. So we assume, we assume that the basic actions are satisfied at all scales and that the theory is weakly coupled in the environment. That's our assumptions. And, and since we're interested in then interplay between infrared and UV, then, then we just take the mass of the, the light stuff to be zero. Okay. So, so mass, we're scattering mass the scalars. So, so the statement that they mentioned that the amplitude over M square vanishes give you some rules that relate each of these coefficients to UV physics. So, so the basic sort of move is that we start from an integral at, around an arc at infinity, you deform it and you get this sort of relation here. Some, some integral over an arc that has size m square and you assume that this arc you can compute within the EFT. It's like at your EFT cutoff. And then there's some high energy stuff. You don't know what it is, except that it admits a partial wave expansion, some of religion polynomial with positive coefficients. That's all we put in partial wave expansion in the UV. So this bracket here, average, you're gonna use it a lot. It's just a sum over, uh, it's a sum, it represents a sum over spin and integral over M square over, over M square of, of the imaginary part of, of the partial waves and, and these are positive. So, so because the coefficients are positive, this behaves like an average. So average of positive is positive. It's only property that matters here. So, so, so then let's just list this some rules. So that's a game that people have been doing for a while. Uh, okay, I, I, the technical thing, I use some rules that are, uh, in this game, you know, we, this, this some rules, they all treat the S and U channels symmetrically. So, so, so you might as well symmetrize an S and U and you'll get less garbage, it simplifies expressions. Okay, so, so that's our some rule. Uh, so the first one that you get, the minimal one that converge with like two, what we call two subtractions look like this. So it gives G2 minus G3 times T. So we, it's a function of T. We can do this some rule at any T less than zero and give you some average of religion polynomials. Then you can do more subtracted some rules and, and they kill lower order polynomials. So the, the four subtracted some rule give you G4. So G4 is the coefficient of basically, you know, S4 plus T4 S4 plus T4 plus U squared. It's the coefficient of minus times the four. So this, the subscript in my coupling is just, oh, just the order in minus times, order in derivative expansion. Okay. So we get this sort of some rules. And, and let's further expand those in the forward limit. Because well, okay, it's just, we have functions of T, so let, let's do the simplest thing we can do. If we expand the forward limit, we get the following more useful some rules. So, so the first coefficient is one over M4 is the average of one of M4. And, and, and the fact that the average is positive is the statement I mentioned before that this uh, by from Adams et al in 2006 and Arkani Ahmed Ratadzi didn't name the people, but some of the audience. So, so, so it was uh, uh, Nicholas, uh, yeah, okay. I don't know if I forget someone in the audience, shout. <laughs> and okay, so the next coefficient because you have to take a derivative around t equals zero, you get the derivative of a legend polynomial, which is a function of spin. So you have to sum over heavy states weighted by one over the mass of six times the spin square, some function of the spin. And, and now we can do the same for G4. For G4, you get one over M8. But the interesting thing you get for G4 is that you notice that there are two sum rules. Like, so literally I'm just like enumerating the first four sum rules you get, okay? And it turns out you get two sum roots for the same coefficient. And, and basically it's because the coefficient of S4 and the coefficient of S squared, T squared are, are related by crossing and inverted. So you get two, cross, two, two equations for the same. We call this a, non, a null constraint. It's a constraint on the imaginary part of the amplitude in, at high energies. And, and in this context, you might think that it's some interplay between IR crossing and, and UV physics, but it has a very straightforward interpretation is that we're using, we're scattering inferred particles to probe the UV. So the, and so the imaginary part of these couplings, they actually know about crossing symmetry in the infrared because we're using IR probes. So I have five minutes left, I believe. So, so yeah, so we have these null constraints. 
So they have, it's very clear what they mean, and, and they represent crossing symmetry in the infrared. They are very useful. Uh, so let, 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 let's see why they, why they need it. So if you didn't have these constraints, some bounds are really easy to see. Like, like you can see that G2 is positive. You can also see that uh, because the, the masses we're averaging over are above the cutoff, it's easy to see that G3 is upper bounded uh, by multiple of G2. So, so this is kind of the derivative expansion. And, but if you try to get the lower bound on G3, you have to somehow estimate the spin. So you have to sum over, you have a minus j square and, and, and you have to sum over the spin of all AV states. So how do you bound that? If you just stop at the first two sum rules, you just give up, there's nothing to do. However, by looking at the next order and this null constraint, this null constraint, roughly speaking, is gonna prevent j square from being large effectively. And you can show this using some Cauchy-Schwarz nonsense. I'm gonna skip this. But uh, after some manipulation, this implies this, so, so the average of j square over m square times the one over m4 factor, so it's like the impact parameter square, cannot be less than, cannot exceed one over m square. So this is a consequence of crossing symmetry in the infrared. You can bound averages of j square or impact parameters square. And this formula is a beautiful interpretation. So basically as far as all these sum rules care, you could declare that all the AV states have size b less than m where the size is defined by the ratio of spin over mass, the usual impact parameter. Okay. So this may clash with what you know about strings or black holes whose you know, string grow direct, the size of a string grows logarithmically, the transverse size grows logarithmically with energy, black holes grow very fast with energy. The point of this formula is that the physics of excited strings and black holes is completely relevant to some rules for effective field theory because of this factor of one over M4 which completely, is completely dominated by the lowest states. And, and it's completely suppressed. The, 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 states, the, the states with size grow with energy will have coefficients suppressed enough that you don't care about them. That's the message. Crossing symmetry on the infrared implies that. And, and once you have this result that the impact parameter, or a typical impact parameter of a state is small, then, then, then it's easy to get two-sided bounds. Okay, uh, there's a method, I will skip the method. So we can get optimal bounds by formulating it as a linear programming problem. Basically you try to find averages that are positive by combining the things you want to bound with uh, these null, these things which average to zero. If you can find an average that's positive definite like this, it gives you a new rigorous bound that G3 is greater than this. And then you try to extremize this alpha to get the optimal number. You're doing this, you get bounds that are significantly better than just Cauchy-Schwartz. So it's worth the trouble. So we have some results. So, so we can bound all ratios of coupling divided by the first one, this del phi. So this, this is uh, this G2 here is this del phi four. So we can bound all the ratios of coupling divided by this one to be uh, this both lower and upper bound. So in units of the cutoff of the EFT, the scale of new physics, you get two-sided bounds and kind of all order one numbers. And, and, the, and then the next thing you ask, you can ask, well, can you bound, can you say anything about the question of this G2 itself? And yes, using the fact that it's sum over spin is saturated by small impact parameters, you can also bound it. So we get uh, the bound in, in units of G, in terms of couplings over four pi square, it's order one, as you might think. So, so basically, so we bound all ratios divided by G2 and we bound G2 itself. So, so we've completely justified dimensionless, dimensionless scaling for this problem of a real scaler. And that's the result. I'm gonna just sketch a few plots, I'm finishing. So, so you can do more things. You can look at correlated exclusion plots of the ratio of G3 and G4 with G2. And then you get uh, things like that. So there's some allowed region. Uh, is two little little kinks, uh, and in fact, you can study uh, by doing some analysis. So this was done with a student. We really got into exploring what these theories were, and we got enough data that we can basically we could write down scattering amplitudes, which realize the theories that these kink. So so the theories will never re the, the points A and B will never be ruled out by this technique because we can find amplitude which satisfies all axioms which realize those low energy S matrices. 
And the amplitudes are very dumb. The first one is just, you, if you just have spin zero particles, you end up on the right ear. And that satisfies crossing, it's fine. Uh, the other one is a very dumb thing. There must, must be something wrong with this amplitude, but with the axioms we put in, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, true. it's one over STU. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 you can subtract a multiple of uh, you can cancel its spin zero component and get the theory a, and that's it. Uh, so using these two theories, we understand analytically and taking linear combinations of them, you generate all the green space. So one simple message here is that uh, if if someone gives you a, a, a low energy expansion and you want to know is it uh, is it allowed or not by by causality, the answer is it's allowed if only if it's a positive sum of those two theories. And maybe fudge a little bit to account for this red patch that we don't understand analytically yet. To be nice to understand it. Uh, okay, you can do 3D exclusion plots. You learn that these things are uh, quotient of G3 and G5. The order five quotient are very correlated. These shapes are very narrow. Uh, so, so that's the sort of thing you learn. And this is it, so I'm done. So, so in summary, yeah, causality implies dimension analysis somehow. <laughs> so causality implies uh, dimension analysis scaling precisely in the sense that you get two-sided bounds on EFT coefficients. That somehow I think it's a new and interesting observation. Uh, a technical comment. Uh, at the intermediate steps, we study the forward limit because that's what everybody does. But then what we learn from the analysis is that uh, also, roots are actually saturated by small impact parameter. So, so expanding around zero momentum is really superfluous. And we expect that if we repeat the analysis with a more clever setup that, do, that does uh, small impact parameter scattering, we're going to get the exact same bounds. And because the sum roots are saturated by that region. And that means that we expect basically the same bounds to apply in Desiter or like any or ADS or other curved space time. As long as you can do localized scattering experiment, around the scale of your EFT cutoff, you expect to get the same bound. So that's something that's very uh, important to explore more. Uh, yeah. So in the future, uh, a caveat of what we did, if you have non identical scalar, then you can write uh, basically a G1. You can write something like, uh, you know, if you have eggs, you can write, you can write something like this. Sorry, uh, x squared dx, x dagger dx square. And that is uh, that gives you an, an amplitude that goes on with s. These are not bounded by the method we have, so so there are some there are, there are, there remains things to investigate that we have not you know we haven't our setup was very special. Uh, what happened? What's special when you have gravity? I strongly believe that we're gonna reveal many interesting things about gravity itself. Uh, some things may look weaker, like uh, scalar coefficients will be weakened by the existence of the graviton pole. But the graviton itself somehow uh, is going to be strongly coupled, and that's very interesting direction to to study. And yeah, trying to embed the, this into ADS space where where the convergence and everything we can make fully rigorous. So we can uh, so in, yeah, in ADS we can make all of these uh, instead of having assumptions and axioms about convergence, we can basically prove everything. So that's uh, the directions. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. We have a couple of minutes for some quick questions, if there are any. Questions, anyone? Can I ask a question? Uh, yes. yes. Um, so you mentioned uh, quickly towards the end that you th think that these bounds are applicable to the sitter. So did you think about applying to the EFT of inflation? Not yet. Yeah. So so I was making a much simpler comment about uh, 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 the uh, so 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 in the EFT of inflation, you're interested in physics above uh, longer scales than Hubble. Uh, I was making I, the, the sort of boundary will directly apply to sub-Hubble physics. So, so whatever effective theory you have on, on, on a subable scale has to be controlled by, by the same bounds as in flat space. So this is maybe not so surprising, but, but the technique will apply directly. For the effective theory inflation, it'd be great to, to, to extend this. So somehow, I mean, the main ingredient in these, all these bounds 
is, is the fact that commutators, uh, that space-like commutators vanish. Singers can go faster than light. The, the symmetry and you know, relativities was not so important. It was really, uh, so you know, causality has got to have implications for, the, for that too, but I don't know where they are. More questions? Uh, Piotr? Yeah, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, are there any, you, do you think you could get uh, also two-sided bounds in 2D, for instance, where we can actually check more precisely uh, actual S matrices? Yeah, I think in, 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 in yeah, in one plus one dimension, the, uh, the uh, uh, S matrix is a function of only one variable. Uh, the sort of bounds I have, they are, they they uh, notice that I neglected interactions in the infrared. So, so so if you want to get bounds in the context where you have a heavy particle, sorry that 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 you have non non trivial interactions at the scale of your uh, well that you the scale of your light particles, you would have to work differently. Uh, but if you have a two D setup where you have somehow a separation of scale, you could apply that. Yeah, it would be much simpler because you just have one variable. And yeah, but this is yeah this is direction that uh, for example Pedro Vieira and collaborators have pursued a lot, but but they are they are they they are much further ahead because they can look at uh, they they treating the infrared not just the tree level. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So we.